All right, we want to say greetings to everyone. Thank you all so much for um, joining us today. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden, and as usual, we're so grateful to the Lord to be able to uh, come before you and share with you these things that the uh, Lord have laid on my heart to share. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles, let's go to the fifth chapter of the book of James. The uh, fifth chapter of the book of James. And we're going to start reading at verse 16. So the fifth chapter of the book of James, we're going to start reading at verse 16. Uh, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, notice what it says there. Um, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, in dealing with people uh, for so many years in the ministry, I see all kinds of personality, I see personalities. I see all kinds of things that I know uh, in, in different instances. It does not line up with the Word of God. And I see these people... Uh, some of these people, even people that, uh, you know, that may be a part of this ministry, I see that prayers are not being answered, which, you know, <laughs> prayers are not being answered. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if people realize that, wonder, I wonder if people think about why their prayers aren't being answered. This gives two different things, the effectual, fervent prayer and then not only does the prayer has to be effectual and fervent but it has to come from a righteous man for it to avail much in other words why because if, if it's coming from a righteous man then that means it's coming from a right place so if you're praying to God because you want a husband but you're not righteous and you can say within yourself I'm not righteous. I'm not doing everything I know to do. Then that ought to show you that your prayer is coming from a wrong place. In other words, you're wanting a husband for the wrong reason. You're wanting somebody. Uh, some people are dealing with lust. And they want a husband so that they don't have to feel they, they don't have to feel guilty when they. Uh lust <laughs> and fulfill that lust or think that they're fulfilling that lust some people want a husband and a wife or companion i should say for the sake of companionship they just want a friend you see that and so if you're not righteous in other words you know that you're not living according to god's standard that you're missing it in an area then that means that your prayer is not coming from the right place that and which means that y your reasons for wanting these things is not right and you you really have to check your heart you could be a person that have been married before and because you miss the companionship you want it back except you're not ready for it you see that because you miss all the different things that comes with marriage you want it but you're not ready for it. And which shows you that it's not coming from a right place. When somebody pray for something that they're not ready for, it shows that it's not coming from a right place. And that the reasoning for them wanting the thing is wrong. You see that, whatever it is that they may be praying for. Some of you, you have prayed for others, for the Lord to heal them, whatever the case may be. And then maybe they didn't get healed. Sometimes people don't get healed behind your prayer. 
uh, because you want to be able to brag about it or it is you know you want to be held up to a certain regard again when we pray it's not just for it to be effectual and fervent but it also has to come from a righteous man and that means that not only you being in right standing with God but by you being in right standing with God you have the right motives there are no ulterior motives you know why how do you know when a person is praying from a right place because they're not pulling their hair out if God is not moving right away they're not mad they're not offended they're not wondering Lord why you know it, it is not bugging them if they're not if God is not moving exactly when he want him to move when they want him to move you see that that's part of how you know when when that prayer is coming from a, a right place and then too I've, I've seen people they pray for things and the Lord don't deliver right away or he may not have an answer for them yet or he has given them an answer and they get offended at God because he's not moving when they want him to move and then they start trying to make their own way and all this other stuff I'm telling you the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is what avails much of a righteous man somebody that is in right standing with God somebody that has the right motive and that's something that you need to pray and ask God before you pray for something you ask God what is your motive behind it some of you want a spouse because you want somebody to help you pay bills some of you that are married now you're only married with to the person because you you know you want somebody to help you pay bills you want somebody to it's like in in other words it's more about you than it is them I'm gonna tell this story. I've told it before. When my, <clears throat> when um, <clears throat> in my father's later years, in my dad's later years, uh, he had got sick, uh, really bad, uh, to the point where um, uh, they had to uh, amputate both of his legs. Um, it started off with him working in the woods. He was he worked in the woods most of his life. And uh, he stepped on something out there, and I guess he just thought, "Well, my foot will heal up." Uh, except, you know, it before it healed up, it gangrene had set in, and then, so they had to amputate his foot and then own up to uh, own up to his uh, uh, up, you know, to his calf. And so, and then they had to do it to the other. But before then, uh, him and my mother, when they met, my mother was working. In fact, my daddy proposed to her. Re really. The first conversation that he really had with her was telling her that he was going to marry her. But after they got married, they got married the same year. And after they got married, he told her, I don't want you to work. You just stay home. I want you to take care of my children. Now, this was, uh, of course, five years before they had children. He's telling my mother, I want you to stay home. I want you to take care of my children and help to raise them. And I'll, I'll be the provider. I'm going to make the money. So you don't have to worry about anything. I'll give you whatever you need and all of that. And, you know, and things like that. So that's what he did. He, and so my the way my mother explained it was that he um, also, uh, whenever he brought his money home, he would lay it all, all out on the table, spread it across the table. And uh, he would set aside so much for bills and so much for savings and then give her uh, some to go spend shopping, buy whatever she wanted to buy. And so she got used to this lifestyle. They were married for 11 years before he passed away. Um, almost 12 years. And so before he died, just a few months before he died, he um, had a stroke and it paralyzed one side of his body. I can't remember which now. But I remember, you know, that uh, him laying in their bedroom uh, in the hospital bed. Uh, they had tried to get her to put him in a nursing home, but she wouldn't do it. She just said, well, just give me a bed and I'll take care of him. And so that's what she did. And so, but bef but when after he got his legs amputated, uh, they um, he was pretty sad. And from what my mother said, he was in the hospital and uh, he, he was sad because he thought that my mother was going to leave him. And so, um, when she, when he found out that she wasn't going to leave, that she was going to be right there with him, 
his spirits was lifted, uplifted so much so that the doctors noticed it and they asked him if he would go around in the hospital talking to the different other amputees to get them their spirits to you know to lift i guess it's something you don't really understand what they go through unless you've gone through it and so that's what he did he spent the rest of his time in that hospital going around talking to the other uh amputees uh to to lift their spirits and because his spirit was lifted why because he saw that my mother wasn't going to leave him that she was going to stick right there with him and so he came home and I guess a few years later he had a stroke and was bedridden. And I remember him laying in the hospital bed. I, I can remember uh, him being fed through feeding tubes. I also remember standing on the side of the bed and eating watermelon and him looking down at me and, uh, and uh, saying, uh, give me some of that watermelon. So I fed him some of my watermelon. That was the last conversation I remember uh, having with him where he spoke directly to me. And uh, I remember my mother taking care of him. You know, he was paralyzed on one side of his body. And so he was bedridden. And I just remember she basically had to do everything for him. I remember all of that. And I, that was my first glimpse of what true love was. And it, it showed me that her getting married and wanting to be married was for the right reasons because she went from being a woman who was pampered who didn't have to worry about paying bills when my daddy died i remember my mother saying when he died she didn't even know where to go pay bills she didn't even know how to put gas in the car he took care of all of that he you know he pampered her and uh so she she had to learn a lot of things you know she had to learn a lot of things you know, and because of how he treated her, you know, as far as just pampering her, you know, and things like that. And so, but it the, the tables turned at some point where she had to take care of him. Those, you know, she, she had to learn how to do all those things, how to pay bills and how to uh, put gas in a car. And, you know, so he was completely helpless for the most part. She, he depended completely on her love for him. She didn't walk around saying, oh, you just, I can't believe you just laying up there sick. Why don't you get up and do something more? You know, how many of you as a, a, a spouse or some of you that want to be married, how many of you could go through that knowing that your, your, you know, your, your spouse is down probably for the rest of their life if the Lord don't do something for them? How many of you would be able to give that kind of love and not receive the pampering in return or not receive it in that manner in return? How many of you could just deal with the fact of your spouse telling you and all they've been able to tell you is that I love you and not being able to show you because of some physical ailment or whatever the case may be? You see that? So in those times is when you find out if your prayer is was coming from a right place because if it's not then you you know as soon as this situation that i've prayed for stop benefiting me then i lo no longer want to be a part of it that that's how you'll act you see that that's how you'll act it is if when this situation stopped benefiting me i no longer want to be a part of it so unfortunately in this society especially we have so much selfishness and narcissism going on that people don't even realize it's all about them. People don't even realize that, you know, they're even praying from a wrong standpoint, from an unrighteous standpoint. You see that? When God blesses us with something, we're supposed to treat that thing right. And we're supposed to have a right, uh, right standpoint from it, a right um, point of view about it. You see that? And, that, and that's so many people, they pray to God for things, but it's the wrong motive. It's got ulterior motives. And we walk and we can walk around mad at God about it. You know, we can walk around mad about it, but he knows our heart. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all. Who can know it? God knows it. And if you're close to God and you're, you have a sincere heart towards God, then you'll want to, um, he'll reveal it to you. But, you know, and a lot of times the Lord reveals things to you through somebody else and you don't want to hear it because you've already taken offense to some other stuff that they've said to you. 
And so in your mind, I'm just going to write it off. But see, and then you wonder why prayers aren't being answered. The prayers of a righteous man. The prayers of a righteous man avail as much. So the question you ought to ask yourself is, am I righteous? See, I, that's why I say I, I know that my, from what I saw with my parents' situation in the last few months there, God gave her the desire of her heart because she could handle that desire. You see that? She could handle that desire. The same way uh, Hannah, Samuel's mother, God gave her her desire when he knew that her heart was in the right place. So in other words, Hannah, you don't want this child just because your husband's other wife is having babies all over the place and you want to be able to show off and you want to have you know, baby time and reading time and all of this other stuff, you know. Some of you wives, and I, I pray, I, I, I sincerely pray that you hear me on this. Some of you women, you want husbands for the sake of having babies. You want, in other words, ulterior motives. Now, I know that may sound crazy to some of you who haven't gone through that, but I'm telling you, there are some of you, you want a baby more than you want a husband. You just want the husband, you just want things to be in place for that baby. So again, the wrong motive. Some of you, as soon as you find out you're pregnant, you can throw your husband away. As soon as you have a baby, you know, God blesses you with a child. You, It's just you and the baby now. Forget the husband. I've seen it. I've seen that up close and personal. You see that? You want babies. And then when those babies grow up and they learn to talk and and they re and and especially when they start separating themselves, you know, like especially male boys, you know, little boys, that's what they're going to do. They separate themselves. They they no longer want to be whiny piney and under mama. Mama gets heartbroken. Why? Because mama have invested emotionally in that child what she should have been investing in her husband. You see that? And so then what takes place again? You, you all, you, you know where I'm going. Baby fever. I need another baby. You see that? God knows those motives. He, he's not crazy. Now, this is your warning. You better get right about your husband, ladies. You see that? You, you get right about that. God don't intend for you to make your child the center of your universe. That's what makes them bratty and hard for other people to deal with. Because you yourself have emotional issues. Even when you pray, you're praying from a wrong standpoint, in other words. is There's nothing wrong with wanting a child. There's nothing wrong with wanting a marriage. All of this. But it is something wrong when you wrong, want it for the wrong reasons. To fulfill some emotional void in your life. That's not why God gives us husbands and wives and children. He gives us these things, especially children, for us to give back to him. You can't give God a child. You can't give a child back to God that you done ruined, that you done spoiled because of your own emotional issues. You may say, well, how in the world did we get off on this? Listen, it's because the Lord's talking to somebody. And now, so for those of you who you're not in this category, just be patient. The Lord will get to you. You see that. But the, the Lord knows how to deal with people and he knows what people are dealing with. Some of you, you want husbands because you want a baby. Some of you, you want husbands because you want a roommate, somebody that's going to help you with the bills. Some of you, you want husbands just because of companionship. You just want somebody to be able to hang out with. Well, I'm, I'll be the first to tell you, marriage is more than babies and paying bills and hanging out. You see that if you're not in your place, you're, you're going to be way off somewhere. You see, that that's what makes it so easy for you to leave. You see, that's what makes it so easy for you to throw your hands up with it. So it has to be from a right place. It has to be whatever you pray for, it needs to be a godly desire. It needs to be a, 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 a good desire. You see that? That, that? It needs to come from that place. You see that? That's, that's where that needs to come from and not not from the place of, 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 well, in fact, let's go. Let's go to the fourth chapter of the book of James and read this real briefly. 
the fourth, fourth chapter of the book of James. We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. What does that mean? Some of you, you pray to God. God doesn't move on your behalf. God don't answer your prayer or God answers your prayer, but it's not the answer that you want. And so what he's saying here is you're lusting after it. And so because you're lusting after it, you're going to make it happen yourself. You're going to do it. I've seen that. I've seen people try to, you know, they want something because of lust. Now, listen, lust is a whole lot more than sex. It ain't just sex. Lust, you can lust after money. You see that? You can, anything, you can lust after other things. And that's what it is. If anything that you're desiring outside of God's will and outside of God's timing is lust. I pray that you get that. Anything that you desire outside of God's will, outside of his timing, from an unrighteous standpoint, it is lust. You see? Verse 2, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. In other words, so you struggling trying to make, trying to answer your own prayer really is what you're doing. And God don't allow that to work out for you. And then some of you get mad and you shake your fist at God because he's not letting you get your own way. You see that? He's not letting you get your own way. See that? You fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Verse 3, ye ask. When you do get enough sense to ask, look at what he says. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss. In other words, away from God, outside of true righteousness. You ask outside of from the standpoint of the way God sees things. It is crazy to me that a woman will pray for her husband. And have no clue of how to submit to a husband. That right there lets you know. Think about all the women in the world that have prayed for a husband. And when they get a husband, don't submit to him. That right there lets you know that it's from an unrighteous standpoint. Why would you pray for something that you're not prepared for? You see that? And, and don't want to be prepared for it. You see? So... <laughs> You ask amiss, in other words, a distance away from God. Your relationship with God isn't where it needs to be. So everything that you're asking for is from a wrong standpoint to begin with. You see that? Everything that you're asking for is from a wrong standpoint. So you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Why are you asking amiss? That ye may consume it upon your lust. You know what happens when you consume something? It's eaten up. When it's consumed, it's no longer there. In other words, you'll find when you ask for something that's, you know, and you are not in the right place with God, and you're asking behind really for the wrong reasons, the Lord is letting you know you're going to consume it upon your lust. You're going to destroy that very thing that God would give you if he give it to you. You'll destroy it. Even if you try to make your own way to get it, you'll destroy it. That's what it's talking about, you consuming it. You, you will destroy the very thing that you're lusting after if it's not from a right standpoint. You see that? If it's not from a right standpoint. And then you'll be crying to the Lord, what happened? I don't know what happened. Well, I'll tell you what happened. You weren't right with God to begin with. That's what happened. You see that? Look at what he says, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. See that? What does he mean? So since you're asking amiss... In other words, at a distance from God, when you get it, that's what makes you an adulterer. Because if you're asking God for something and there's any space between you two, you and the Lord, that means you're going to put that thing that you're asking for in between y'all. That's what makes you an adulterer. You're going to consume it. That, that thing becomes more important to you than God does. Some of you, your children, more important to you than God is. You won't discipline them the way the Bible tells you to. That child is more important to you than God. Some of you with your 
uh, your your spouses, you can't submit to your spouse, you know you're still an adulterer? You know why? Because God's word is not as important as your own will in a situation. Look at what he says. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What happens? A lot of the things that we're asking for has to do with worldliness. You don't have to be saved to desire a spouse. Worldly people want to do that, but it's for the wrong reason. And that's what makes you part of what makes you a friend of the world. You see that? That's part of what makes you a friend of the world. Look at what verse 5 says. Do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusted to envy? In other words, it's naturally so. It Lust is there. Naturally so. Which is why, look at what that says. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. See, so that lack of humility is what makes us ask for something before we're ready for it or what makes us ask for something that is not according to God's will. So that's what that's talking about. Look at what that says. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. When you are asking from a right place, you will get what it is that you are praying for. Why? Because when you're in right standing with God, you're got, not going to ask for something that's not according to his will. You see that? You're not going to ask for something that's not according to his will. But when you got lust there, you want to fulfill that lust, you'll have enough nerve to go to God and ask him for help for you to fulfill that lust. And that's what makes it so perverted. You see? So the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man are you righteous? That's what you ought to ask yourself. Am I righteous, Lord? Am, am I in right standing with you? If so, then the Lord will grant you your prayer. Then your prayer availeth much. Amen. So we want to say thank you all for joining us today. I pray that something has been said that has blessed you. Again, we want to make this uh, known. If you consider yourself a part of this ministry, uh, you know, and of course you're not attending any other ministry, please send us an email and let us know. Because we, we'd like to know, you know, who is it that's out there that consider themselves a part of this ministry. We'd like to know who you are and know who we're praying for, who we need to pray for. Amen. You can send us an email at gtdministries at gmail.com. All right. So thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to sharing more of God's word with you. Have a blessed day.